The Essenes have an aura of profound mystery about them. Becoming perfect light humans is clearly the goal of the Essenes. They knew mystical secrets, and these secrets had to do with human transformation into celestial beings and ascension. Why were they called Essenes? A name awarded them doubtless in recognition of their holiness. Holiness means to be luminous, radiant, and angelic. From this investigation, we will piece together the Ascension teachings and disclosure of extraterrestrial beings left for us by the Essenes, just in time for the arrival of the new humanity in the modern Ascension and Disclosure movement. I'm William Henry, and this is Ascension Keepers. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Anunnaki as beings of light. And uh, as part of my introduction, I just briefly wanted to talk about uh, the kind of the lens through which I, I view the Anunnaki and how I came to this hypothesis and, and this viewpoint. Um, first started reading about the Anunnaki in 1991. I had gone to my first UFO conference in Tucson, Arizona, and I learned about Zachariah Sitchin, for, who for many was the kind of the the door or the gate that, that led into studies about ancient Samaria, Mesopotamia, the, the Anunnaki, and so forth. And I always remember um, the first time I read his book, The Twelfth Planet, around 1991, and just kind of having some tough time sort of uh, tracking what he was saying in a way, because he had this hypothesis, as we know, that the Anunnaki are flesh and blood beings. They come from a planet called Nibiru that suffered a cataclysm. It smashed into another planet uh, called Tiamat that uh, was split in two, and half of that planet became the asteroid belt. The other half became Earth. The Anunnaki follow on to Earth, and they have a quest for gold, according to Sitchin. He never actually said that, but th th that became the gospel of Zechariah Sitchin. But at the time, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm following him saying, is that the Anunnaki came here for gold. They wanted to mine it out of the, uh, the oceans, but that didn't work. So they, they found this primitive being, Homo erectus perhaps, uh, wandering around, and they get the brilliant idea that they're going to uh, fashion their DNA, if you will, tweak their DNA and create a slave race to mine this gold for them. Well, the problem that I had from it from the very first reading was that at the same time that he tells us about Enki, this brilliant geneticist who altered our DNA, he tells us that Enki is also an alchemist. And I remember thinking, well, why did he need to tweak uh, Homo erectus's DNA to mine gold? Why didn't he just grab a hunk of space rock and transmute it or something? And then as I've continued thinking about this, I, I came to this idea that actually the, the alchemist, the goal of the alchemist is to ultimately uh, purify their own soul, to take their lead condition and perfect it and to become a shining, radiant being symbolized by gold. So the lead to gold transmutation is really about us. So I started wondering, well, what if, what if Enki came to earth, not in a quest for gold, but rather on a mission to save souls. What if after this cataclysm, we've got souls that are embedded in the earth and somehow he's got a way to, got to find a way to lift them up. Well, uh, that's how I started to view the human body that Enki tweaked the human body to make it a more conducive vehicle for the ascension of the soul question mark. What if this is what is going on? And five years later, I'm, I'm uh, lecturing in Denver at uh, the first Sitchin study days, and I never looked back. I, I knew Zechariah, traveled with him, loved him, consider him a, uh, in a way a prophet, and in no way I'm disparaging his work. We're all kind of following his path, but I clearly diverged. And the whole time that I'm working on the, the little enigma there of were the Anunnaki here for gold or souls, running in the back of my mind continuously is my deep and passionate interest in early Christian mysteries, especially about parallel worlds and, and the light body. I've been on that path since 1982, and I wondered, is there some way that there's a correspondence between what I was learning about with the Anunnaki 
and early Christianity and, and this concept of the light body. And it turns out uh, there are connections that uh, the Sumerian stories, their myths and their teachings wove their way into many different traditions, including the early Christian. We're gonna, we're gonna explore some of that. So what I wanna do now is take a look at some of those, those connections with you. And then we'll talk more directly and specifically about the Anunnaki as light beings. So I'm gonna share my screen. We all know the story that these fallen angels left the throne of God. And this is the tie-in to the Anunnaki because the Anunnaki left the throne of Anu originally. And they cross over a perceived or could be an actual forbidden barrier. They're, they're, they're on the throne of God and they're not supposed to, to cross over this barrier and, and take on physicality. That's what it's, it's really all about. But as in the example of the fallen angels in, in Genesis, who are, many believe, is the same as the Anunnaki, and I, I subscribe to that belief, we see them in, in Judeo-Christian art crossing over that boundary and taking on physical flesh and blood bodies. That's why they're called fallen. Fallen doesn't mean they're, they're evil or they're dark. It just means they're no longer in their original state of being at the throne of Anu, who is the king of the Anunnaki, or the throne of Yahweh in the Old Testament. They're fallen because they cross over this forbidden boundary and they take on human incarnation. They see the daughters of men, as Genesis records, and they have hybrid offspring who we refer to as the mighty ones, the mighty men. They're, they're often called the Nephilim, but originally they're called the mighty ones or the mighty men, the mighty men of renown. And the reason why they're called the mighty men is because they possessed a transmittable cloak or garment that was brought to earth by the Anunnaki. And all who put on this garment, including the Nephilim, were referred to as giants or mighty ones. This is not to say that they couldn't possibly be uh, extraordinarily tall, maybe as 12, 15 feet tall in some cases, but they were called the mighty ones specifically because of this transmittable cloak or garment. And I've spent 20 years following around the myths and legends of that transmittable cloak. But when we're looking at Yahweh on the throne, we can envision that this is how the Anunnaki thought of Anu the king of the Anunnaki and how we thought of the Anunnaki as they fell into physicality and then took on uh, the human flesh and blood bodies. We know that there was this original transformation from a higher state of being into a lower or fallen state of being because the New Testament says that the watchers are the angels which kept not their first estate. And the watchers, of course, are uh, considered to be the same as the Anunnaki. So they are the angels which kept not their first estate but left their original habitation on the throne of Yahweh or the throne of Anu and are now bound by everlasting chains of darkness awaiting the, the great day of judgment. Now, here's the key thing. The Greek word translated here, first estate, is oketerion, which according to Strong's Bible Dictionary, speaks to a dwelling place or a habitation of the soul. It's the dwelling place for the spirit. It's an abode for the soul. That word, Okitarion is used in only one other place in the Bible, and that is in 2 Corinthians 5.2, and it refers to the resurrection body or eternal spiritual light body of Christ. Now, what that means is that in their original habitat at the throne of Anu, the Anunnaki are in exactly the same state of being as the resurrected Christ. That means they're in a, 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 a light being status that as portrayed here in this example by Hans Memling of John the Revelator peering across the rainbow bridge beyond the veil into the throne of Christ, which is equatable with the, with the throne of God that I am connecting to the, the throne of the Anunnaki. When Christ is portrayed in this manner, he is clearly not in flesh and blood form. He's in a spiritualized light body form. And there are other people that live there. In the Gospel of Hebrews, they're referred to as just or righteous humans who are made perfect, which means they are fully developed. They're whole, they're holy, they're complete, they're angelic beings. And so from this initial perspective, we're saying the Anunnaki were in that light being status, the very same one that Christ attained in his resurrection. Well, in my work, as I developed it over the, the next 20 years from 1996 on, I'm introduced to the Tibetan uh, rainbow light body concept, which is the Tibetan view of our original divine state of being. Radiant, 
luminous, rainbow colored, were perfect. The, the, the great perfection refers to the attainment or the revelation of our true divine nature as light beings. And the images that we're seeing here are obviously interchangeable. They're, they're, they're equatable with one another. It's the same state of being. This teaching is not Christian, it's not Tibetan, it's not Sumerian, it's cosmic. And it, it's talking about a state of being that all of us ultimately can attain. And as Philip said, uh, the Lord rose from the dead. He became as he was, but now his body was perfect, meaning whole, wholly complete and compassionate, just like the Tibetan great perfection. He possessed flesh, but this was true flesh. Our flesh isn't true. Ours is only an image of the true. Now, what this means is that Christ and the Anunnaki I'm proposing had the ability to phase in between a flesh and blood phase and then into a higher frequency, if you will, light body state of being, a perfect state of being. And all of us are capable of doing this. All of us are capable of doing this. So that's an initial connection with the Anunnaki as light beings. Another connection that caught my imagination, and this was, again, going back to the mid-90s, in my study of esoteric or mystical Christianity, is this scene. This is a painting by Nicholas Poussin, a man who is said to have known secrets that made him more powerful than any king. This is a painting called Autumn, Grapes of the Promised Land, of milk and honey. And it illustrates a story from the Old Testament when Moses and the Israelites are headed for the promised land and Yahweh orders them to stop short and to send out two spies from each of the 12 tribes. As we see here in this painting, Joshua and Caleb are dispatched to a place called Eshkol, which means valley of the cluster, as in grapes. And they come back to Moses and they say, Moses, we're not going anywhere near Eshkol. One, the sons of Anak dwell there. Specifically, the num book of Numbers says the sons of Anak dwell there. Those are the offspring of the Anunnaki. That's the Nephilim. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of the Anunnaki, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So they're just trying to describe them as giants in some way, but very clearly they're telling us that the, the Nephilim, who were supposed to have been destroyed by the flood, survived the flood. They crossed over and they were living in Canaan. And Joshua had an encounter with them. Not only that, but he stole this oversized, massive cluster of grapes and pomegranates from the Anunnaki and then comes back to Moses and said, we're not going near Eshkol because the place is well fortified. The sons of Anak dwell there. And furthermore, and here's the, the important, even more important point, Joshua says that the land there eateth the people up. Now, when you look to your Bible commentators, they say, well, that must mean that the, the land didn't provide enough food for the people. It ate them up. But that's belied by the fact that we're in the promised land of milk and honey. So how could that be? It can't be that. It's, Joshua is the, the trained successor to Moses who knew all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He's not some dumbass guy running around. He knows what he's what's going on here. And Numbers is just being, uh, is obfuscating what he's talking about. I think what he's talking about is that Joshua sees people walking along the surface of the earth and they suddenly vanish. The land eateth them up. And part of the reason I started to think that was, again, looking at, at Poussin's painting, is he has this very mysterious hole filled with light behind Joshua and Caleb, almost as if they have just emerged from that, that hole of light. What if, big what if, that could be a portal? And Joshua and Caleb are watching the Anunnaki walk along and they suddenly vanish from the surface of the earth, but they follow them. And they go to some other worldly locale, or perhaps inner worldly locale, and retrieve this oversized cluster of grapes. They come back to Moses. And you think the book of Numbers would make a really big deal out of this revelation, this, this theft. Instead, Numbers drops the subject cold. You'd think they'd say something like, oh, yeah, Moses took the oversized cluster of grapes and made a lot of wine. And all that. We all got drunk and we put the, the pits of the grapes in the Ark of the Covenant, something like that. But nothing. It says nothing. And, and I wandered around for a long time wondering, well, what happened to those that cluster of grapes? And then uh, my first answer came. I was in Sion, Switzerland, and I saw a woodcut. 
that I later found also uh, in a print in the British Museum that told me exactly what some believe happened to that cluster of grapes stolen from the Anunnaki. And the answer is, it was taken to the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, the Bible commentators that discuss this say that these two events, the theft of the otherworldly or innerworldly cluster of grapes from the Anunnaki and the events of the crucifixion are concurrent. They're concurrent that Joshua and Caleb were present at the crucifixion. In fact, they're the two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus. Now, that's kind of bizarre to think that there's some kind of time distortion going on here and these events are happening simultaneously or they're, they're somehow entwined with one another, but that is the belief. And when we look at this, uh, this beautiful print from the British Museum, we see Joshua and Caleb bringing that cluster of grapes to the crucifixion and we see this portal of light, this mandorla, this gateway of light opening behind Jesus, along with the cluster of grapes, which always symbolizes interconnection between, uh, not only on the earth plane, but also interconnection between star systems uh, on the cosmic scale. So the way I started to read this is there's something going on here with the, the crucifixion and Jesus's transmutation into light and his attainment of his Okitarion spiritualized light body, exactly the same light body that the fallen angels had and the Anu had before they fell. And, and what we're seeing here in the crucifixion. And I wanted to know more about how that, that came to be and, and what those, those secrets are. And that led me to the realization that the first Sumerian stories involving the Anunnaki are actually ascension texts. They're, they're, they have nothing to do with, uh, with a quest for gold, for example. It's all about ascension. In the Atrahasis, we learn that in a quest to create a servant of the gods, Enki modified the primitive human species, Homo erectus, by putting on it the image of the gods. And of course, Enki is considered to be the serpent of the Garden of Eden. And that's why he's portrayed here as half human and half serpent. So what is that image of the gods? Well, it's probably alien or Anunnaki DNA. The, 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 the Anunnaki splice some of their DNA, mix some of their DNA, perhaps with some kind of like CRISPR technology like we have today, and they created a new being. They didn't, they didn't create it in the sense of bringing it up out of nothing. I should use a better term that I like to use. They, they fashioned, they made humans, okay? They didn't manufacture us originally. They just tweaked us. They fashioned us. Ninti would fix upon it the image of the gods and what will be is man. So there's very clearly a merger going on here that we're hybrids. We are hybrids of these Anunnaki beings and uh, a, a primitive being that was uh, cur con currently living on the earth when the Anunnaki arrived. arrived. Now, that first being, that first model human is called a Dapa. And he's thought to have been given all the, the, the wisdom of, of Enki. And in one of the key stories, immediately after his, his making, Adapa is taken on a journey, a path of souls, if you will, to the heavenly realms by Enki. Enki made him take the path of heaven and he went up to heaven. And when he went up to heaven, he drew near the gate of Anu and Tammuz. In Gisada, we're standing at the gate of Anu. Now, does that sound like something you do with a slave race? No, it doesn't sound like something you do with a slave race. If you're creating slaves, you probably don't want anybody to know about it because you're, you're acting pretty immoral in doing that. What if, as I'm saying, the reason the Anunnaki came here was for souls and they tweaked the human body to make it a more conducive vehicle for the ascension of that soul? Wouldn't that then fit with this ascension journey that the first model human goes on? He goes through the gate of Anu to the throne of Anu. He's crossing over that forbidden boundary that the fallen angels had just burst through just a moment ago. Enki disclosed him the ways of heaven they fetched him the bread of eternal life, but he would not eat. That's another story about why that is. They fetched him the water of eternal life, but he would not drink that either. They fetched him a garment. 
and he put it on himself. They fetched him oil and he anointed himself. Look at how this event is portrayed in, in Sumerian art. It's, it's a very clearly an ascension image that we're looking at. Adapa is rising with these squiggly lines emerging from his body that could, could symbolize frequency, water, perhaps even light, okay? But the key thing here is that when you look at that image, it, it is virtually uh, duplicated a few thousand, many thousands of years later, actually in, in Italy by Giotto in the ascension of Christ. It's exactly the same story. Christ ascending on a cloud, as we're told that he did in the book of Acts, while angels are in attendance. Adapa ascending on some kind of a frequency or vibration, while Anunnaki gods with their horned helmets attend this event. It's the telling the same story and is yet another connection between the Jesus story and what we know of of the story of the Anunnaki and their ascension teachings. So it became pretty clear to me that this is what's going on, that the Anunnaki were originally in their, at the throne of Anu, were in their spiritualized light bodies. Then they fell into their earthly flesh and blood bodies, but they could phase back into their higher frequency bodies, just like Jesus did. That's my premise. And I know that that, uh, is uh, is never mentioned by Sitchin. It's never mentioned by many uh, commentators on the Anunnaki, but this is the, the, the connection that I've put together. And part of what helped me to, to put that together is the second oldest story. The, the second oldest story is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The second oldest human story is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. And it's another ascension story. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is told by a goddess, an Anunnaki goddess, Anana, that he's two thirds divine and one third human. And if he wants to make it through the gate of the gods, which is ultimately all of our goal, he's gonna to have to clean up his act. And this is what we see here. And some people's opinion is in the cylinder seal is Gilgamesh in the gate of the gods, again, surrounded by squiggly lines indicating water, frequency, vibration. He has scaled four stairways and two figures called janitors hold open the ring or ringing singing posts of this gateway. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the second oldest piece of literature or religious text after the pyramid texts, which are also about human trans transfiguration and ascension upon a stairway to heaven. It comes from Egypt, of course, written about the same time. So here's Gilgamesh in the gate, surrounded by this frequency with the two janitors holding open that gateway. Now, look at this image that I took in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Oh, pardon me, I'll get to that in just a moment. Let me put this, this very important statement from Gilgamesh on the table first. That is, Gilgamesh says, straight is the crossing point, the gateway, which is the Nibiru. That's what the word Nibiru actually means according to the Sumerians themselves. Nibiru is a star, it's a gate, and it's a crossing point. And it, it drives some academics crazy when I add the words star and gate together and say that Nibiru is actually a star gate. And this is why the Anunnaki are continually portrayed coming through gateways. That's the Nibiru. And Gilgamesh is saying this, that straight is the crossing point, the Nibiru, and narrow is the way that leads to it. Narrow is the way that leads to it. Now let's look at the, the, the photo I took in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Well, wait a minute. This is Jesus wearing a rainbow colored cloak with a luminous halo, standing in a radiant gateway flanked by angels on either side. And he's standing atop three steps or stairways. It's the exact same image from Gilgamesh. It's the exact same image. Not only is that exactly the same, not only is the imagery the same, but Jesus must have read the Epic of Gilgamesh because he quoted it verbatim in Matthew 7, 13, when he said, enter through the narrow gate, the Nibiru, for wide is the gate, the Nibiru, and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. It's the exact same teaching 25 centuries later 
we're still talking about the same thing in the time of Jesus. Now, two, 20 centuries after the time of Jesus, we're still talking about how we get through that gate and still trying to fully understand it. But in my opinion, these are exactly uh, telling the same story. And it is another firm and undeniable connection between the ascension stories of, of, of Jesus and the ascension stories of the Anunnaki, um, including the story of Gilgamesh. Very important connection that, that I've presented here. And I um, want you to, to, to look at this, not to say that Christianity is some kind of like false or fake religion or something like that, as some people might like to say, or, you know, you know, Jesus never existed, which is a lot of bunk anyway. But the idea is that humanity has been on this ascension quest for many, many thousands of years. And once we start to pay attention to it, we can link, especially the early Christian mysteries with those of the Anunnaki. And it's all about how they attained the state of being is a light being that we see uh, exemplified in the story of Jesus. And then also, of course, as I said a moment ago, in the Tibetan tradition. Now, my specific, uh, work, my additional work in this regard concerning this light body and garment of light really started to pick up in the early 2000s with my uh, 2003 book, Cloak of the Illuminati. Of course, I've been researching this throughout the 90s and then early 2000s, finally put out this book where I'm, I'm looking at all these examples of the Anunnaki um, put forward in, in, in some of these books and saying, I'm, I'm going to look at this a little bit differently. In particular, I'm looking at Inanna, the, the Anunnaki goddess I mentioned just a moment ago. This is a, a life-size statue that was discovered by French archaeologists in 1934 in Syria. Zechariah Sitchin made a really big deal out of this statue because to him, it was very clear that this is Inanna in some sort of a spacesuit similar to what uh, an Apollo astronaut would have worn. And I, you can look at the A to B comparison here and you can see, okay, I, I get that. Sitchin felt that the Anunnaki were traveling around in, in rocket ships, like an Apollo rocket ship. That's, nobody thinks that anymore. That, that is not, we, we know that they were at least as technologically advanced as we are now, probably maybe hundreds, if not a, a thousands of years in advance of us, which means they, they didn't use rocket ships. Okay, they, they traveled the stars probably through portals, gateways, wormholes, something we're on the verge of doing ourselves. So this statue is discovered in 1934. It's placed in the uh, museum in Aleppo, Syria. When the, the, civil, the unfortunate civil war happened in Syria, this was taken and is still uh, in some unknown location. It was taken by archeologists and hidden away. It's, I hope uh, one day I'll be able to, to come face to face with it. Because the story of Inanna's descent, which is told in this statue, is in fact the oldest human story. And it's the prototype for all heroes in search of ascension. The first half of the story of Inanna's descent in, into the underworld presents the soul's heavenly origin and the defilement of the soul in the material world, the nether world, the earth world. And the latter half of the story then presents Inanna's way back to her heavenly throne. In other words, her ascension. When Inanna begins her journey, she's arrayed in the seven May powers. May powers. We're going to talk about these in detail from now on. And she acquired these seven May powers from Enki. These are the crown of heaven, an anointment placed on her eyes, a robe of sovereignty called the pallid garment or miracle garment, lapis beads around her neck that were painted in rainbow colors, uh, a breastplate or a pectoral, a golden ring, and she carries her lapis rod of power in some instances or her uh, cup containing the elixir of immortality. When she arrives in the underworld, her sister Ereshkigal commands her to remove each of these seven divine powers, one at each of the seven gates to the underworld. Crown, scepter, clothes are all removed until Inanna, naked and lacking in her powers, enters the throne room of Ereshkigal naked. Then she's hung on a nail for three days. She's crucified on a nail for three days and then ascends. Well, this is... A, a very important ascension story because you're either going to look at that 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 her seven May powers are actual technologies, or they represent psycho spiritual attributes within all of us that we can all activate on our own ascension path. 
For example, her horned helmet, the shigura is the crown of the step. Sitchin said shigura means that which makes go far into the universe, really caught my attention. She's got on her, her rainbow necklace. Then we see that she's also wearing or got her the water of life and, and the or the elixir of immortality in her vase, like a grail cup. And she wears her miracle garment, the pala garment, the robe of the soul. Now, the exaltation of Inanna goes into uh, even deeper translation and further describes Inanna and her seven powers, saying, Lady of all the divine powers, the May resplendent light, righteous woman, clothed in radiance, beloved of honor, Anu, mistress of heaven with the great pectoral jewels. What this is saying unmistakably is that Anana is radiating light, that she's luminous. She's a righteous woman clothed in divine radiance. She's illuminated, illuminated, and she's radiating light. In fact, the Sumerians describe seven powers called Ni, which usually translated as terror or aura. And one scholar uh, translate, them, translate them as magic rays and says that they're capable of physical effects. So if we accept this, then what this is saying is that Inanna is radiant and luminous and she's got magic rays coming off of her that can affect us. Now, what's interesting to me is that in the Bible, there are a number of magical objects that match up with the May that Inanna received from Enki, including the breastplate of Aaron, which is a jeweled breastplate made of 12 precious gems that radiate light that are all set in this gold breastplate. This breastplate was worn in conjunction with the Israelite high priest when he interacted with Yahweh on the Ark of the Covenant. These, these stones that were uh, housed within them called the Urim and Thummim, channeled the word and the will of God and rainbows shone from this breastplate when the sunlight hit them. Now, in my view, there could have been an actual crown that the high priest is wearing as he's in front of the Ark of the Covenant. This could be Aaron and, and Moses here. Um, there could be an actual rod of enlightenment and the incense and the ascend breastplate as it's called and the gold bells. These could be actual objects but in my opinion, I think like with Anana, they are also psycho-spiritual attributes. The crown of salvation is our open crown chakra. The breastplate is our heart chakra. Uh, the, the, uh, the belt of truth that the high priest wears is exactly that. The sandals of peace are uh, telling us to walk in peace and speak truth. So they're physical objects possibly, but they are also most certainly aspects of our consciousness that we can awaken and activate. And when we do, this is called the perfection of our being. We become more whole, holy, and complete because the high priest is, is among the holy ones. And this is exactly the same symbolism we see with in the Tibetan rainbow light body tradition with the resurrection stick, the crown of glory, the gold and rainbow rays, the vajra, which is uh, the Tibetan key of life, symbolic of compassion and action. There, it's He's the, the Tibetan image that we see on the left and the, in the Hebrew image of the holy, of the high priest, I believe symbolically are interchangeable and ultimately telling the same story that a human can become a holy one by activating these latent capabilities within us. And as we become holy ones, we become of the same essence or substance as the angels and ultimately the Anunnaki. For example, this is, in this instance here, we see the Archangel Gabriel visiting John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple to tell him that he will bear a child, John the Baptist, who will be the forerunner of the Messiah. This angel is phased in and then phases out after this encounter with uh, John the Baptist's father. And we're told that uh, Zacharias put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. So he's wrapping himself in a light or a frequency or vibration as in a cloak in order to interact with this angelic being who's just phased into his awareness, perhaps even in a physical sense, in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. The Essenes uh, picked all this up, and they believe that in order to enter the celestial realms, the throne of God, Sion, 
which is I'm equating with the throne of Anu, one is required to become like the angels, the Anunnaki, who dress lightly in a white robe of glory. Attaining this robe of glory or robe of light required a transformation or perfection of our being from earthly flesh to celestial flesh to which the Essenes claim to be experts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, writing to his, as an Essene to his Essenes, espouses Essene belief when he says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem being a celestial city, a mystical celestial city parked in Earth's orbit somewhere um, that is accessed through 12 Nibirus or 12 gates. This is the Virgin Mary uh, being visited now by the Archangel Gabriel, who is being uh, wearing her robe of the righteous, her robe of light that uh, indicates her ability now to enter into the higher frequency realm of the celestial city of the New Jerusalem, Sion, and the other names ascribed to this otherworldly locale. In my view, Mary and Inanna, who's also called Ishtar and Mari, are attired exactly the same way for exactly the same purpose. Mary is wearing the garment of light because she intends to ascend to the celestial city, just like Inanna did. And in one final image here that, that links this together in this section, we're once again in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, where we see the ascended Christ wearing this luminous or radiant cloak that's just sizzling with light at the edge of its uh, at the edge of the cloak. This is the pala garment. This is the miracle garment of the Anunnaki. So let's talk for a moment about the May, because they are the real key to the Anunnaki ascension stories, the Anunnaki ascension teachings. And Nana is said to have stolen the May, the magical tablets or accoutrements of wisdom the magic uh, items of power from Enki and to have delivered that knowledge to her own people. According to Sumerian legend, it was at his temple medical facility at Eridu, which is in present day Iraq or Kuwait. It was there that Enki, who became Lord of Earth and the guardian of the secrets of all scientific knowledge, stored the May tablets of destiny. Now, there's no question that the Anunnaki were hugely scientific. They were master builders, megalithic builders. Um, they had advanced knowledge of mathematics. They could obviously travel the stars. And what I'm suggesting is that the May uh, were those tablets that originally encoded their secrets of how flood can be transmuted into a light being status for travel into the stars. These crystal-like objects were sometimes worn on the body as ornaments. They contain knowledge, including astronomy, astrology, and temple building. And I also believe uh, ascension. In myth, the May also contained the healing secrets of the gods and possession of the, these information devices conferred tremendous power. And this is the, the wisdom of Eden, if you will. Enki is considered once again to be the serpent. This is the knowledge that somebody does not want us to partake of. The word May is curiously found in the word Sumer or Sumeru. Who were the Sumerians? They were the people of the May. They were the people of the May, tablets of ascension. The word May appears in this all important word in my research, Melamu. The word Melamu was unknown to Zechariah Sitchin. It's nowhere to be found in his works. It's nowhere to be, it's not even discussed in most conversations about the Anunnaki, at least unpopular uh, uh, discussions. I found it in the academic world where PhDs routinely discuss the radiant luminous aspects of the Anunnaki and are very comfortable with the notion that they are in fact some kind of uh, leggings. The term Melamu is used to refer to the radiance of kings, heroes, and gods, the Anunnaki. It means radiance and splendor, and it denotes a characteristic attributes of the Anunnaki, a sparkling vital force. It's what distinguishes the Anunnaki from humans. This phenomena of radiance uh, is a motif that's woven throughout Sumerian and Akkadian literature and, and art. It originates with the Anunnaki. And biblical and all other accounts of radiance and luminosity are based on the Sumerian originals. The Melamu as a garment is composed of wavy lines 
and it covers the, the bodies of the gods. It's a robe of light. And the word malamu, as I said, is a, is a Sumerian word that means divine radiance. So when you see a cylinder seal, the Anunnaki as we're looking at here, wearing these garments with wavy lines, that actually symbolizes radiance, luminosity, magic rays coming off the Anunnaki. And of course, they're, they have their other attribute, the, the horned headdress that we're going to, or, or crown that we're going to speak of momentarily. One of the academics that I follow is Sean Astor. He wrote a book called The Unbeatable Light, and, who, and he concluded that Malamu is specifically associated with strength and power. This is why the Anunnaki were called the mighty men, the mighty ones, and the giants, because they possessed this cloak or garment that gave them this tremendous strength and power, made them mighty ones like Superman. A working definition of Malamu, says Astor, might be the covering or outer layer of a person being or, pro or object, which visibly demonstrates the power of the person being or object. And in myths from the second millennium, Malamu refers to something concrete and tangible. So they're saying that it's an, it's an actual garment that the Anunnaki would put on as, they're, as they phased into earth life and enable them to navigate in this realm. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Malamu is tightly connected to the superhuman strength of the, possess the possessor. Once again, this is why they're called the mighty ones or the giants. One section narrates the, the defeat of Huawa by Gilgamesh. The radiant sheen or sheath of Huawa's Malamu glows when he is powerful and dims when he is less so. Sounds like a technology. It's got a power source, but maybe it comes from within the body. But if he loses that power source, the, the, the radiant garment just diminishes. Gilgamesh must take this protective covering or cloak from uh, Huawa in order to subdue him. They can then be handed over to him, but he must remove it immediately from his body before it loses its brightness. So it's just to me, again, a power source or perhaps the organic uh, power comes from the body of Huawa himself. And Gilgamesh perhaps can learn how to activate that, that power from within himself. The clear thing is that according to uh, the Sumerian texts, wearing this robe gave the Anunnaki a supernatural awe-inspiring sheen, a glow of whiteness, light, and supernatural force. Now, there are some authors out there that would ask you to believe that the Anunnaki were called the shining ones because they rubbed oil on their skin and it made them radiant. Well, I can go get some olive oil and rub it on my forehead and that doesn't make me an Anunnaki, okay? Um, I have ser serious differences with people that think the Anunnaki are shining ones just because of this oil. That's far more mystical and profoundly powerful than that, okay? Yeah, maybe the Anunnaki did put, put on a protective oil, but the texts say nothing about that. They say the Anunnaki put on a protective cloak, okay? They don't say that this cloak came from an oil. They discuss an oil, but they don't say the cloak came from an oil. They, they talk about it as a supernatural force unto itself. So I just don't dismiss entirely this oil connection. I'm very interested in it. But I also don't think the Anunnaki were called shiny ones because they put olive oil on their skin and it made them iridescent. Okay. It's... This power, this glow, this sheen, this sheath is the distinguishing attributes of the Anunnaki. And it's what separates us from them. This is why we really got to take a serious look at this. And so here again, we see Shamash in this example here, wearing the, the Malamu. You see the wavy lines indicating frequency or vibration. He's like, maybe perhaps would appear distorted to a human being seeing him. But it's very clear that he is portrayed as radiant and luminous, pure and holy. In fact, the Akkadian word Elu, which is the basis for Elohim, the shining ones in some people's opinion, actually means pure and bright. So the Anunnaki were pure, bright, luminous, radiant, and the Malamu gave them superpowers, making them giants or mighty ones, as I've said. And a human, and here's the key thing, this is what has driven my research since the year 2000. A human can acquire this cloak. A human can receive this cloak or garment from a divine being, whether it be an Anunnaki 
or Christ or other avatar type being. I've, I've tracked this through multiple traditions and they all say the same thing. Humans can receive this cloak or garment from a divine being. And we can become mighty ones or giants by acquiring this wavy garment. And one way and that, that I specialize in, in, in acquiring this is through sacred art. Because the Anunnaki were the originators of the concept that art can be used as a stand-in for a deity, that a piece of stone can be infused with the vibration of the deity and standing before that stone and receiving its divine radiance is just as good to them as standing uh, before the God himself or herself. That's profound. And uh, that, that is the basis for my art and science of living ascension workshop. You can find it here on uh, portal to ascension.com. You can also find it on williamhenry.net. Um, wish we had a few hours to go into that right now, but we don't. So we'll move on. And we'll, we're recognizing that in each of these instances, we're seeing the Anunnaki wearing the Malamu and their distinctive horned headdress, the crown of Anu as it's called. We're going to look at that here in just a moment. But another couple examples of this combination of the Malamu with the horned uh, headdress or crown. Uh, this is Shamash, the sun god, seated before Hammurabi. He's giving him the code of Hammurabi. And he wears the horned crown, and he's also got flames or rays coming off his body. This is indicating that this cloak or garment is emitting the magic rays of the Malamu. And so very clearly, the king clothed in the Malamu was a representation of the divine power of the Anunnaki, and humans could get close to receiving this cloak or garment. And one way is through these images that we are looking at here that contain the, the, the divine essence or vibration of these beings. Here's a good example. In the Sumerian mind, uh, the image of Shamash, the sun god, is Shamash, okay? That's something you really just have to accept. This is from the British Museum in London. We see Shamash seated on a throne with the Malamu on. In the detail here, you very clearly, or excuse me, uh, in this detail, you very clearly see the wavy lines, and he's sitting on a platform also composed of the same wavy lines, and he holds the rod and ring of sovereignty, which he's transmitting to a human. This is referred to as uh, ensouled or living art by the Sumerians. The Sumerians believed that this tablet was infused with the vibration of Shamash, and not only that, but that Shamash is present through this image. As long as this image exists, Shamash can be present. So if you're standing in front of this in the British Museum, as I've done many, many, many times, you're literally standing in front of the sun god Shamash and are capable of receiving his, his vibration, which again, you see in the detail, the, the wavy lines coming off the body. Now, just last night, uh, this is February 19th, 2022. Last night, Ancient Aliens debuted a show on... Uh, of uh, 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 ancient uh, American star walkers and star beings. And in this episode, myself, Giorgio Sukalos, and John Dover got together at a place called Rock Art Ranch near Winslow, Arizona. We went there to investigate these tremendously interesting, many, many thousands of year old petroglyphs that we see at Rock Art Ranch, including this one that looks like a gray Got one there next to him. It looks like Bugs Bunny with this horned figure. We've got these shamanic figures wearing their horned headdresses or crowns similar to, to the Anunnaki. But what really got our attention, it certainly got my attention, was this figure here, this trapezoidal body with the wavy lines and a, a double helix, what appears to be a double helix right next to him. And I remarked to Giorgio, and we discussed this actually uh, on the episode. It made it into the episode. I said, Giorgio, that, that that garment that this figure is wearing with the wavy lines, that's the Malamu. That's the Malamu of the Anunnaki. I'm sure of it. I mean, you can see the correspondence here. So what if that, that is what we're looking at here? I can't 
irrefutably say that that's what's going on. But I do believe that we are looking at a correspondence between these images. And I further will tell you that I believe that the sun god Shamash and Christ the sun portrayed in his resurrection body, that these images are also interchangeable. That in fact, Christ is wearing a Malamu type garment of divine radiance in his resurrection or, or glory body. We call it in Christianity, the glory body, the resurrection body, the light body, all these terms that are uh, that originated with the Malamu. So I'm very comfortable in asking you to connect these images, the Anunnaki wearing the cloak of divine radiance and the, and the resurrection body of Christ. I think they're talking, it's the same state of being. Or, okay, let's go to the middle ground. What if it's the same state of being? Is this suggesting a crossover then from ancient Sumerian Anunnaki teachings through Babylon into the Hebrew tradition, all the way into Christianity? I think we have to very definitely be open to that, that, that concept. We can go into the Jain tradition. The, the British Museum is just a treasure trove of light body art. I have an article on my website, williamhenry.net, the light body or robe of light in the British Museum. If you're interested, please follow that up. You'll see this image here where we see this Jain deity very clearly wearing a, a garment, a, a radiant luminous garment composed of wavy lines that suggest to me that it's the same as what we see with Shamash wearing. He's even got a horned headdress on. So what if we're, we're the, the Anunnaki were these demigods who had the ability to phase in between their light body and their earthly flesh and blood body? I'm not saying that they're they're perfect in the sense that they're holy beings because they there's some pretty nasty stuff going on in the Sumerian texts. Lots of jealousy among the Anunnaki, lots of theft, lots of murder, so lots of amoral behavior, creation of slaves. These are not entirely righteous people. But they did have a technique. They had a technology. They had an ability to uh, manifest radiance and luminosity through a cloak or garment that they could then transmit to humans. Very similar to the crossed garment of Osiris, the resurrection body of Osiris in Egypt. And here we see, of course, Isis with her horned headdress on, standing beside Osiris wearing his luminous, radiant uh, garment, uh, his resurrection garment. We find, once again, the same thing in Buddhism, where we see the same kind of cloak idea. Anu, the king of the Anunnaki, the being, the divine being for whom they are named, is portrayed in the British Museum wearing the Malamu and the horn crown called the crown of Anu preeminently pre worn by Anu, who described himself as Lord Proud Tiara. Now, I wish we had the full body depiction of Anu here. and We would see that his whole body was probably clothed or cloaked in the Malamu. And his horned headdress is, is very important because that is, that is the identifier of Anu and indeed the Anunnaki. This is a a stone also in the British Museum, the Kaduru of uh, Nazimuratus, it lists and shows the symbols of the gods beginning with the throne and headdress of Anu, king of heaven. And uh, Nazimuratus himself wears a, a, a star cloak uh, as well as a, a feathered helmet. So here we're, we're being once again shown that the crown of Anu is the, the signifier of the Anunnaki. Uh, it's an example of these May objects that, that we're describing. Here's Asher Bannerpal, who's also portrayed uh, with the, the horned headdress or crown of Anu right beside his forehead, in fact, and also uh, wearing May objects. The horned headdress is, is portrayed here, where we see, obviously, it's the signifier of the Anunnaki, Inanna, uh, with wings and the horned headdress. Another example of Anana wearing the horned crown of Anu. Now, here's a very, very important connection that we, that we make here that really, in, in my view, sort of starts to really complete my, my hypothesis. In his last public appearance before his death, renowned Sumerian scholar, Dr. Jeremy Black, connected the Sumerian term for uh, horns with the word brilliant the brilliant appearance of divine or semi-divine objects. Horn-like and brilliant 
he said, appear closely related in Sumerian. And he links the shining horns of the Anunnaki, including as we're looking here at Anana, to the words radiance, glow, and luster. And in particular, says Black, the visual effect of shining horns is often described in the Sumerian context with the verb G-N-N, which means to be multicolored, similar to a rainbow. Now, wait a minute. What Black is saying, and, and this is like his deathbed confession, the last thing he wants everybody to know about the Anunnaki is that their horned crown of Anu represents radiance and luminosity and is directly connected to the rainbow? That means the Anunnaki are radiating rainbow colored light? Yes, that, that is the connection that we're making here. And what this horn symbolism means is that the Anunnaki were radiant, glowing, and luminous, rainbow colored, and iridescent rainbow luminosity was the key identifier of divinity in Mesopotamia. It's what separated humans from the gods. And as evidenced by the story of Adapa, humans could be elevated to the level of the gods. We can ascend. And the fact that the very word divinity derives like the Sanskrit deva from the Indo-European root dev, meaning to shine, illustrates the interconnectedness of divinity and luminosity. And friends, they didn't become luminous rainbow light body beings by smearing olive oil on their skin. Okay, there's more going on here than that. What I am asking you to, to consider here is that Anu, with his rainbow crown on and his Malamu garment, shimmering, iridescent, luminous garment, is in the exact same state of being as we see Padmasambhava here in this Tibetan rainbow light body image. What if they are the same? That completely changes everything we know about the Anunnaki, everything. And I believe that it aligns us with their true nature. And this connection of the radiant horned headdress, similar to the one Moses uh, wore, when he uh, is portrayed after the burning bush incident, incident, Moses's face glowed. It shone like the sun. And in Christian art, they show Moses wearing horns. That's a mistranslation of the word rays. It's not horns that he's wearing, it's rays. Just like in, in the Egyptian depiction we're looking at here of, of Queen Nefertari, Abu Simbel. We have Isis and Hathor on either side of her, obviously attuning her in some way, and Nefertari wearing the horn headdress and a garment that I might can identify, or and I do identify, as the Malamu. What we're seeing here is the awakening of this goddess Nefertari. And as, I, as we follow this thread into Egypt now, we pick up more resonance with this idea of this light body garment as being the gift of the gods that found its way from Samaria into the Egyptian tradition. And it's very important for us to acknowledge this. So here we are in the tomb of Nefertari in the Valley of the Queens, a place we visit always on our uh, sacred Egypt tours. We see Nefertari wearing her transparent linen garment tied with a red sash. And she is in a, 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 a position of adoration uh, just in front of this double helix here uh, that, that's come into the picture that is actually part of the hieroglyph of the Egyptian god Ptah. According to the ancient Egyptian, Ptah is, a, is the god who fashioned the human body. He fashioned the human body. Many, many, many scholars acknowledge that Enki and Ptah are the same god, that Enki's mythology made its way into the Egyptian tradition where he's known as Ptah, and it makes perfect sense because why else would uh, Ptah have a double helix in his hieroglyph unless he's a master of genetics just like Enki was, right? So in this scene here, Ptah is standing um, in his, his enclosure before this radiant stairway to heaven, the Osiris or, or the Tet pillar behind him. And Nefertari is offering to him the Egyptian hieroglyph for new clothes. And the way I read this is she is saying, thank you, Ptah, for fashioning my DNA, for tweaking my DNA so that my soul can ascend through this more perfect vehicle that you have uh, made for us. 
that's that's what I see going on here. And she then becomes the exemplar of this teaching. She's a, a priestess of Isis. Her red sash symbolizes something very profound in these scenes, as does her transparent linen, linen garment. That linen garment, that, that, that's the malamu that she's tied with her red sash. Now, now look at this image of Mary many centuries later, she's wearing the same red sash and it's specifically the knot of Isis. What, what is the meaning of that red sash? It's one of the most mysterious and secretive symbols in all of ancient Egypt. And I've done a presentation here at Portals to Ascension on this and you can look it up. Uh, look up the red sash in William Henry. Identif I identified this as symbolic of an umbilical cord that enables these illumined beings, which is what they are, to travel in between dimensions. The reason I say that is not because I'm making it up. I say that because one day I was in the LA County Museum of Art and I saw this gorgeous image of the white Tara with this red sash wrapped around her and rainbow colored britches. And I came home and I hit the books and I track down the meaning of that red sash. And I find out that some shama shamanistic groups believe that their sorcerers can ride rainbows and ascend to the heavens. They use red and blue ribbons to symbolize rainbows. And some scholars hold that the red and yellow silk ribbons that hang from the tankas are reflections of this idea. Well, right there, it's putting forward this, this, this hypothesis that the red sash is a shorthand way for an artist to say that this figure is in their rainbow light body. And that is what I believe the red sash means when we see it wrapped around the, the waist of Isis and Mary and other figures in the Egyptian and Christian tradition. They're, they're telling us exactly the same story. Nefertari is thanking Ptah for helping her to awaken her rainbow light body so now she can travel into the dimension of the blessed. The white Tara is wearing her red sash, symbolic of her ability, along with her rainbow britches, to travel interdimensionally, to attain her original sacred or divine status as a luminous, radiant, perfected being of light. I believe, and I'm asking you to, to, to connect this, that Pata and Padma Sambhava, their names are phonetically similar, are in exactly the same state of being too. That, that Pata, as an Anunnaki, had the ability to phase into his flesh and blood body and then to, to experience earth life, then to phase back into his rainbow light body, his Malamu body, and, and travel interdimensionally. And this ability is something he wanted human beings to have as well. And when Pata fashioned our DNA or fashioned the human body, he did so to make it a more conducive vehicle for the soul to attain its ascension and its rainbow light body. So the Tibetans don't say this, the Egyptians don't say this, but I'm asking you to, to follow me along in this connection because I think it's entirely valid. I think it's supported by the text. And I think it opens up a window into what is, uh, in, enfolded within our DNA and, and how it got there. And also the, the, the innate spiritual abilities that we all have to attain our rainbow light body, to attain our resurrection body, our glory body, and to tr ascend into the celestial realms and join all the other ascended beings, whether it's from the Christian, the Tibetan, the Egyptian, the Sumerian, whatever tradition you like. They are all telling essentially the same story and they all update it. And that is why, that is the secret of heaven that the fallen angels, the Anunnaki brought here when they left the throne of Anu, just like when the fallen angels, angels left the throne of God and they crossed over this uh, band of stars, which could represent a zone of space time um, or it could represent traveling interdimensionally. 
when they crossed over that realm, they left behind their original divine light bodies, their Okitarion bodies, and they fell into flesh and blood bodies. And some of them remembered how to phase back into their original divine light bodies. And this is the ultimate mystery school teaching of all the mystery schools. And if there's one thing that's going to, I would ever put on my tombstone, I'm probably going to be cremated, but the one thing I would ask anybody to take away from William Henry's however many books and however many decades of research, it is this right here, that the, the body of the watchers in its original form and the, the resurrection body of Christ are actually the same state of being. And that as Christian teaching tells us, we all have the ability to mirror Christ in his resurrection. We all have that ability. And my goal as a researcher or presenter is to assist you in connecting with this aspect of yourself. And now I hope that through our investigation today, our exploration today, you've been able to connect the dots between these all important traditions and recognize that it was perhaps the Anunnaki themselves that originally brought these light body teachings to earth. They're sacred, they're available, and it's up to you and I to, to recover those teachings because now is the time when we need them.